All right, the class won't be the entire chapter 17. It's only on transplant rejection. What makes organ, reject, uh, organ transplant successful is a close enough matching of HLAs. First of all, what are HLAs? These are protein um, markers found on the surface of every cell. So our body will have one type of HLA. So this will allow your immune system to recognize self from non-self. So every time you have a foreign invade, invader, whether it be a, a virus, a bacterium, or a fungus, when your immune system cells, specifically cytokines, which trigger the immune system to respond, when they encounter these foreign HLAs, then that would trigger your immune system to respond. In the cases of organ transplants, since the only exact match is if you have a identical twin, um, it would be therefore necessary for the patient and the, uh, in the case of the, the donor, to be immunosuppressed. Um, in the case of the donor, the donor will only be immunosuppressed uh, shortly before the transplant, a few weeks before that, and then the, for the patient themselves, who is the host, will have to be immunosuppressed for a, uh, pretty much for, for forever, uh, as long as the, the graft stays in the host. Uh, to clear things up, um, the recipient, I will refer to the recipient as the host, and the donor, which is the donor organ or tissue, will, we will call, uh, we will refer to that as the graft. Okay, let's fast forward to table 17-4. So what are cytokines? Cytokines are part of your immune system. These are the same categories as histamines. They are not technically the white blood cells that attack and kill invaders. Rather, these are, in the case of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, they are the, <clears throat> the, the part of your immune system that triggers the activity or gets the ball rolling. For instance, there are four that we will discuss today, interleukins 1, 2, 6, and tumor necrosis factor. These four pro-inflammatory cytokines are responsible for organ rejection, meaning these are the specific parts of your immune system that takes part in the mechanisms involved in organ rejection. For instance, interleukin-1. This induces fever, stimulates production of prostaglandins, which are vasodilators, and then increases the growth of CD4 plus T cells. You definitely remember CD4 plus T cells. These, or, these are the types of lymphocytes that were attacked by HIV viruses um, last semester. Interleukin-2 increases the growth and differentiation of another uh, group of T lymphocytes and also enhances the natural killer cell activity against cancer cells. Uh, interleukin-6 stimulates fibrinogen and protein C in the liver. So this is involved in clotting. And then finally, we have uh, another activity there is to increase the rate of bone marrow production of stem cells, which produce your white blood cells. And then finally, tumor necrosis factor. This is the major one <clears throat> involved not only in organ rejection, but also the symptoms in rheumatoid arthritis, in uh, loop, um, in psoriasis, whether it's uh, psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis of the skin. We'll come back to table 17-4 shortly. Um, but these are the, the cytokines that our drug therapy will be targeting, meaning it, it makes sense to, it, it's smarter to target specific cytokines rather than 
suppressing the entire uh, immune system as a whole because we don't really need all of the white blood cells to be suppressed. We only need specific ones that participate in organ rejection. So let's go now to the three types of organ rejection, or transplant rejection, right? So there are three, hyperacute, acute, and chronic rejection. In hyperacute, we will answer, in all three, actually, we will answer three questions. One is, when does it start? Two, how does it happen? What is the exact mechanism? And then three, what can we do about it? So let's begin with hyperacute rejection. When does it occur? It begins immediately on transplantation, but however, it can occur at any time upon transplantation, the moment the doctor removes the clamps from the blood vessels that he, ha he has attached, he or she has attached to the, to the graft. And then as soon as blood flows there, hyperacute rejection can begin right there. So we haven't even got out of the operating room yet. Or it can occur any time until 48 hours after the transplant. So that is a short period. So again, most common occurrences is immediately on transplantation. So what happened? Although we did several precautions already before we performed the organ transplant, meaning we suppressed the donor and the recipient's immune systems in order for this to be successful, we also, uh, in the case of a cadaver, for instance, if the organ was um, from a, a dead donor, we, we um, washed it properly, making sure we have as little to no white blood cells remaining in that cadaver tissue or organ before we perform transplant. So what happens here is we miss something. So there are antigen antibody complexes that, that were left behind in the graft, meaning this is of no fault of anybody. No, we did uh, diligent care in order to prevent this from happening. And like I said at the start, this is quite rare because of all the uh, precautions that we take nowadays because matching is hard it's hard to find a, a matching organ once we find a matching organ uh, we we're careful to make it successful to prevent this type of rejection however it happens so again the cause here is something was left behind in the in the graph causing an antigen antibody complex and what these things do are they adhere to the lining of the blood vessels and once they do that they will attract therefore clots they will attract platelets to form and stick to the surface of the blood vessels. So what happens is there's widespread clotting and it will therefore cause every capillary, every artery, and every vein in this graph to be occluded with clots. There's only one thing we can do. The, 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 the graph is gone. It's not viable anymore because it's, um, it's all clogged. All the vessels inside it are clogged. So the only thing to do is to take it back out and give the bad news to the patient. Any question on hyperacute rejection? All right, let's proceed with acute rejection. So first question is, when does this occur? It occurs first between one to three months after transplantation. So the patient here is already home. They're not in the hospital anymore, unlike hyperacute rejection, wherein the patient will be in the hospital for at least 48 to maybe 72 hours before they're sent home. Uh, here in acute rejection, this is already a week to three months. So the patient's out of the hospital, at home, enjoying life. In the case of a kidney, for instance, a kidney transplant for the first time in how many years, this patient is off dialysis. So they're they're celebrating their, um, their new life uh, pretty much. However, this can also occur sporadically, meaning there's not one instance that this, this will occur, meaning there's no limit. It may occur once during the first week to three months of the transplant. However, throughout the, the life of the graft, as long as the graft stays in the host, this can occur repeatedly. There's two mechanisms involved here. First is 
vasculitis, not the same as hyperacute, wherein the, the cause here are antigen antibody complexes causing the clots, attracting clots to form. This one, it's the vessel itself. It causes vasculitis. And because the, 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 the vessels here, um, when they're inflamed, they, they thicken. Therefore, when they thicken, that will narrow the lumen of the vessels and then therefore cause necrosis. However, this is not uh, enough to, to kill the organ because this is not going to involve all the vessels, not like here in hyperacute rejection. So in acute rejection, it will just affect a few vessels. However, it's the second mechanism that really destroys the graft. It's, it has something to do with T cells, meaning even though we, we already gave the patient medications, immunosuppressive medications, in order to stop those cytokines that I mentioned earlier, the interleukins 1, 2, 6, and TNF, the body somehow found a way to increase production in order to, to do their job because the immune, your immune system has one job, which is to kill and destroy whatever is foreign. Now, remember that the graft will always remain foreign here. So the... As long as that graft stays in the patient, the, the, the job of your immune system is to find ways in order to destroy it. Okay, and, then, and this is exactly what it's doing here. So the, your immune system somehow found a way to increase production and then still penetrate the, the graft and then killing the cells in that graft. So that's how, and then now what can we do about it? All right. Um, as stated here, one episode does not mean we're going to lose the organ, right? Uh, there's drug management. We can either increase the doses of your immunosuppressive agents or even add more medications. Okay, so if, if, we, if we stop that, then we stop that mechanism because we now stop the cytotoxic or cytolytic activity of the T cells by adding more medication or increasing the doses. And then that should stop it. However, as uh, stated here, it can occur sporadically thereafter. So maybe in a few months again, the body will do this exact same thing, and then we will do the same thing also. We will, um, the doctor will adjust the medication doses as well as maybe add new medications during these episodes of acute rejection. I'll give you examples later after we finish chapter 17. Any questions? Yeah, Professor, if it, um, if it occurs sporadically, is it still considered an acute rejection or is that more of a chronic rejection now? No, the, um, it's, the mechanism involved here is different from, will this chronic rejection next? But uh, the mechanism is not the same. So it, it, it's still acute rejection, even if it occurs again and again. Okay, okay, thank you. Even if, yeah, I think what you mean, uh, meaning even if it, this occurs for several years, maybe uh, over 10 years, you'll have 10 acute rejection episodes. Yes, that's, that will, that will, um, that's exactly what will be happening. However, just because it occurs over several years doesn't change the type of rejection because the same mechanisms are involved. This thing and this thing here occurs. Okay, it's, it's either vasculitis, or, or cytotoxic or cy slash cytolytic activity. Okay, thank you. All right, next thing is the chronic rejection. So when does this occur? This is several years in the making. The changes here are so subtle. So the, the exact mechanism here is because of chronic inflammation and scarring. So similar to what happened to the first part here, wherein it has vasculitis, this one, though, occurs so slowly. So whenever you have inflammation in one area of the graph and then followed by another area and so on, the changes, though, are so subtle, so slow. And this is what happens. So the smooth muscles of the arteries outgrow. And then the same thing as what happened in the first mechanism in, in acute rejection, when arteries the smooth muscles, the walls of the arteries overgrow, then of course it will occlude or narrow the vessel, causing tissue ischemia. But because it occurs in small sections at a time, 
it kills small sections at a time and then that small section that died becomes scar tissue and then we move on to a next section and another and another so for several years because the, these are uh, occurring so slowly we, the doctor seldom sees any acute changes okay plus uh, the whole time of course the patient is growing older right so uh, year after year, the, the patient's also growing older and uh, more and more of these um, parts of the graft are, are killed and then replaced by scar tissue. Over time, what happens is the graft is now overrun with scar tissue, meaning there's more scar tissue than functional tissue remaining. Does that make sense? So now, what can we do about it? We cannot stop this, although we can delay it. Delay how is we can, the doctor can adjust medication just like what they did here in acute rejection. They will increase the doses or even add new medications. However, it will not change the outcome. It can delay it, meaning in the case again of a kidney transplant, for instance, it's, so it's like the patient's kidney failed all over again, just like what happened in the first place with their original organ before the transplant. So again, there's no cure for chronic rejection. And this, uh, as stated here, this thing happens in um, most transplanted organs because uh, right here, the pro process probably occurs to some degree with all transplanted solid organs obtained from donors who are not identical siblings, right? So sadly, this will occur. And when it comes time that the organ is gone, uh, then we're back to square one. So in the case of a, if this was a kidney transplant, then the patient goes back to dialysis again and are put on the transplant list again. Any question on chronic? Let's go to management now. Chart 17-2, page 301. There are three groups of drugs here. First are corticosteroids. We only have one, prednisone, and we just concluded our treatment for Addison's disease and treatment also after adrenalectomy in the case of Cushing's disease. So the patient is taking steroids for life, right? Lifelong steroid replacement, both corticosteroids and glucocortic uh, mineral corticoids. So in the case of the prednisone, we know that the patient will develop Cushing syndrome. And these are the uh, consequences of long-term steroid therapy. So I won't repeat this again. We already discussed and tested this part. So this was what I meant when I said that you will, you're, you're not done with steroids yet because we will still discuss patients that will be on steroids um, for the rest of the semester. And this is one of them. Next group are calcineurin inhibitors. Now, unlike steroids, look at the action of steroids. They broadly inhibit cytokine production, meaning all those cytokines we talked about earlier, cytokines, uh, namely interleukins 1, 2, 6, and TNF um, factor, they are all going to be inhibited by steroids. Meaning steroids is, if you think about a weapon, uh, steroids is more like a shotgun rather than a um, a sniper rifle wherein you have more precise targeting, whereas steroids will target everything. Okay, so therefore, that's why you have so many side effects here. However, calcineurin inhibitors aren't without their own side effects. Uh, if you remember interleukin-2, um, it said that they enhance the activity of na the natural killer, ce uh, killer cell activity uh, against um, cancer cells. So that's why the number one complication here is malignancies. So taking this drug, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, can result in other forms of cancers because they are your, your immune system, your, your lymphocytes or natural killer cells 
are no longer able to fight cancer cells because you are taking the drug. So this is a natural consequence. Along with, uh, specifically for cyclosporin, this thing causes gingival hyperplasia. This was, if you remember, this was a common side effect of phenytoin under seizures for anti-seizure medications. And because they still generally inhibit T lymphocytes, so there can be opportunistic infections here, just like what HIV people um, uh, develop. That's why if you see commercials for these drugs, they have one thing in common. Uh, the commercials will go, before starting cyclosporin, your doctor should test you for TB or tell your doctor if you had TB or are prone to getting TB, right? If you saw those commercials, this is one reason. Um, TB is an opportunistic infection, meaning you and I are constantly exposed to TB, but we never get sick because we have good immune system. So they're called opportunistic infections because they wait until your immune system is so suppressed or so low before they can cause problems, before they can infect you. Last group are anti-proliferatives by the name itself. Uh, they inhibit something essential to DNA synthesis, so therefore they prevent cell division. However, since drugs cannot distinguish between what, you know, what cells they want to prevent cell division, so therefore they will inhibit all of them. These are the two most common drugs. You have azathioprine, which is imuran. If you remember this last term also, this was given to patients with lupus as well as uh, multiple sclerosis uh, because bo both of those disorders are autoimmune disorders. And then we have mycophenolate, which is the cheaper version of the two. Uh, Celsept uh, is used more commonly for uh, organ rejection. And because this is their action, therefore you have stem cells in the bone marrow, uh, which are rapidly dividing. Uh, so that is suppressed along with any other system in the body with rapidly dividing cells, such as your GI tract. So that's why you have nausea here. Um, and opportunistic infections again, but uh, both will cause bone marrow suppression, which results in anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. And that's it. Those are the only three groups of drugs. Any questions? None, let's go to kidney transplant. Let's go to chapter 68. Okay. Hey, too hard, not so hard. Like, not so hard, not so hard, baby. Okay, table 68-13, page 1423. So here is a comparison. Uh, the kidney transplant is the perfect example because not all transplants have all types, all three types of rejection. Um, in fact, your textbook only mentions acute rejection for liver and then the same thing, acute rejection for a heart transplant. So those are the only three organs we will be uh, testing. So kidneys, so we have a hyperacute, acute, and chronic rejection. So this is the perfect example of what chapter 17 was talking about. So time, here we have hyperacute rejection occurs within 48 hours after surgery. And the signs and symptoms, if you notice, there are no symptoms of acute or chronic kidney injury here. Be the reason is this occurs so fast within the first 48 hours. In fact, when this occurs during surgery, meaning you're still at the operating table, there, so therefore there's no time to see or for these symptoms of kidney injury and chronic kidney disease to develop. 
because again, the time period is this, this occurs within minutes to a few hours. Okay, so the development is so fast that these are the only things you see. Increased temperature, pain at the transplant site, and increased blood pressure. Uh, treatment that's mentioned in chapter 17, there's nothing we can do, just take that organ out. In the case of acute rejection, so exactly the same as what chapter 17 says, one week to several months uh, after surgery. So here, if you compare this to uh, the earlier part of chapter 68, uh, which you discussed and tested last semester, this is equivalent to the oligoric phase of acute kidney injury. So there is oliguria, uh, rise in temperature, but then here are your signs and symptoms of acute kidney injury, specifically again during the oliguric phase, wherein the patient's in fluid overload, meaning the, the kidneys shut down in a matter of um, days or, uh, or you know, a, a week uh, when that's the development of acute rejection. So you'll see uh, a shutdown of your kidneys or, or the kidney in this case, uh, because you only have one. Uh, you have hypertension, enlarged tender kidney, lethargy because of the increased BUN creatinine, so that will cause now uh, acidosis, and then you have fluid retention. However, uh, because this is acute rejection, you won't see the, um, the, the symptoms of the, um, the diuretic phase here of uh, acute kidney injury. So you only see the oligoric phase because um, in, in this instance, unless you stop the, the, um, the, organ, the, uh, the acute rejection, then the patient will lose the organ right away. However, look at chronic rejection. So as stated in chapter 17, it occurs gradually from months to years. And the increase in the BUN creatinine here, unlike here wherein it, 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 um, it's readily observable in a matter of hours or days, this one is so small, meaning the patient is developing chronic kidney disease here, if you, if you, think, if you, if you look at it that way. So the change here is uh, like the RIFO classification in CKD, as you discussed last semester. So they go back to risk wherein they, their um, GFR drops down below 60 um, mLs per minute and then goes down further from that to 45, 30, and then below 30. So the symptoms here are, again, the gradual changes. Of course, the patient will have hypertension here also, um, but more because of the gradual uh, development of the symptoms, you, you see more of fluid retention as well as the uh, rising electrolyte levels, specifically of uh, potassium and calcium as well. And then there's fatigue because of the same thing as uh, increased um, BN creatinine, plus of course the, uh, the decrease in the production of erythropoietin, which is one of the um, functions of the kidney, which is to increase red blood cell production, right? So there, there will be, again, the, the symptoms here are consistent with chronic kidney disease. And as stated in chapter 17, all you can do is increase the dose, which um, again, does not stop this, but can delay the progression. Meaning we're, we're just delaying the onset of dialysis here for as long as we can. Any question on kidney rejection? All right, let's go to liver next. All right, there are two items here. Please look at this action alert, uh, page 1188. So these are your first set of signs and symptoms. Um, and then you have a table here, uh, under common post-op complications after transplant. You have just the first row, acute graph rejection. So here are your, uh, there are, I looked through, I combed this chapter, there is no symptoms of hyperacute and 
chronic rejection mentioned here, so only acute graft rejection. So uh, it's consistent with what you saw in chapter 68, which were signs and symptoms of acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. This is also the same. If you look at the signs and symptoms, they are consistent with either acute hepatitis or liver cirrhosis. Here you have fever, right upper quad pain, um, yellowing of the skin, and I suppose there would also be darkening of the urine here because now you have bilirubin leaking into your, uh, into your kidneys. And then lab changes will be, of course, increased uh, bilirubin, increased ALT, increased ALT, AST, and uh, prolonged PT because the liver is failing, so therefore you'll have increased bleeding. And then from there, it's like the patient's developing cirrhosis, but this one, of course, is due to acute rejection, okay, not an infectious or not lenic cirrhosis. And just like with what chapter 17 says, what we can do is manage the drug therapy, okay, increase the doses, um, or add more medications. Any questions on liver rejection? So, Professor, uh, for the liver also, if it's uh, acute, um, it's at home, but it, there is no hyper, this thing, right? Hyper acute rejection for liver? Yeah, like I mentioned, I didn't see any hyperacute or chronic rejection in chapter 8. All right, thank you. So I guess that means this is the most commonly occurring type of rejection for liver transplants. Okay. And lastly, let's go to the heart transplant. So similar to, uh, uh, never mind, uh, this is different. You have a critical rescue here, but the signs and symptoms, you are referred back to chart 35-10, so which is here. Just like in chapter 68 and chapter 58, what were the signs and symptoms of rejection? They were signs of the organ failing, correct? So same thing here. Chart 35-10, you know that the patient's having acute rejection is because the patient has signs and symptoms of heart failure. So if you compare this to chart 35-1 and chart 35-2 earlier in the chapter, they are really the same. Signs and symptoms of left side or right side heart failure. Although AFib was not mentioned in either chart. Uh, AFib and A-flutter, these are dysrhythmias that result after you have serious congestion of blood in the atria, uh, which will cause irritation of the uh, some cells within the both left and right atria, causing, causing them to fire uh, ectopic, ectopic signals, causing AFib or flutter. And that's it. Management is the same. Um, please refer to chapter 17 for the management. So for the signs and symptoms specifically are found in chapters 35 for the heart rejection. And then we have chapter 58 for liver rejection. And then finally 68 for your kidney rejection. Any questions?